Hey everyone, Rich Gassaway here. There are two really exciting events on the SA Matters horizon. In September, I'm organizing National Situation Awareness Month and scheduling programs for a nationwide tour event unlike anything I've done to date. Then in October, the Situation Awareness Matters tour embarks on an international tour with programs in Melbourne, Australia, Sydney, and Perth. And then I'm going on to New Zealand for programs in Christchurch and Auckland. And then on to... The Netherlands for programs at for the Amsterdam Fire Brigade and the Dutch Fire Academy, and then on to Antwerp, Belgium, for three programs. <clears throat> for anyone who wonders what that might look like, in 27 days I will fly 77 hours and deliver 13 programs. That's going to be without a doubt the craziest tour I've ever attempted. Stay tuned to the website and social media feeds for updates on this wild ride. If you want to be part of the September North American Tour or the October Australian New Zealand European Tour, go to the SA Matters website and click on the Contact Us tab. If you want to train your members virtually, you can do that too with the SA Matters Online Academy. The Academy teaches everything you need to know about situational awareness and high-risk decision-making. The Academy, Academy opened for enrollment in January. <clears throat> We've already had more than 700 students enroll. Did you know that issues related to situational awareness are consistently identified as contributing factors in near misses, injuries, and fatality events? Please, please, don't wait until your agency has had a critical injury or fatality incident. Please don't wait. I get to work with the departments that have experienced critical injuries and fatality incidents, and they're some of the most hurting organizations you can imagine. Please don't wait for that to happen to you. Seriously, I can take your understanding of situational awareness and high-risk decision-making processes to the level it needs to be. Visit samatters.com, click on the green button on the right side of the homepage, labeled Online Academy. For our premium enrolled students in the Academy, they get to participate in a monthly webinar where I have guests talk about important safety topics. This month's webinar was Chris Nam talking about building construction <coughs> excuse me, and the situational awareness connection. The next webinar is scheduled for June 4 and will feature Joe Pernesti talking about incorporating simulation into your command training. Premium enrolled students will get a notification sent to them in the course room along with login credentials. Okay, that's enough pre-show stuff. Roll that podcast intro. For years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. This is Firefighter Lionel Crowther from the Winnipeg Fire Department. And you're listening to Dr. Richard Gasway on SA Matters Radio. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help us see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. Hello and welcome to episode 162 of the Situation Awareness Matters radio show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situation awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high risk, high consequence, time compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple, to help you see the bad things coming and time to avoid bad outcomes. If you're new to the podcast, you have some homework to do and go back and listen to the past episodes. I've released a new episode every Tuesday, never missed a week, for through over three consecutive years. And I do that for you, the listeners. You inspire me to work harder for you. I've shared the message of situational awareness and high-risk decision-making in live programs for over 12 years to almost 59,000 first responders. I'm here for the long run. <clears throat> for so long as I'm able, I'll continue to share this message. A message of hope, a message of inspiration, and a message of encouragement for all first responders who want to make sure they're able to develop and maintain strong situation awareness and make quality, high-risk decisions. I'm dedicated to helping to improve your safety and your survival and to helping you accomplish the very most important goal of all, to go home to the ones who love you. 
And speaking of sharing the message, I'm coming to you today from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where I'm in town for two weeks doing some situation awareness consulting and training for the United States Navy. And while I'm here doing the work for the Navy, I'm also doing companion programs for the Hartford, Connecticut Fire Department, the Stoughton, Massachusetts Fire Department, and the Belmont, Massachusetts Fire Department. These are what I call companion programs. One of the questions I get asked a lot by readers and listeners are, when are you coming to my area? Or where are you going to be next? <clears throat> Great question. And the answer is really easy to find out. There's a link to all the upcoming events right on the home page of the SA Matters website. Just click on the blue box on the right side of the home page labeled Upcoming Events Schedule. I feel very blessed to have some very exciting presentation opportunities on the horizon, including Fire Rescue International in Charlotte, a program for the NASA Glenn Research Center, the Australian tour that I mentioned, the New Zealand tour I mentioned, the European tour that I mentioned, programs for Phillips 66 petroleum refineries, and no doubt more programs for the United States Navy. Stand by and we'll share those details when they're finalized. If you're interested in hosting a Situation Awareness Matters tour stop in 2017 or 2018 for your department, your association, your region, your state, or your company, yes, our trainers do programs for private industry too, just contact me through the samatters.com contact us tab and we'll get something set up for you. I promise you it's not a hard process. And if you want to save some money hosting programs, I do what's called companion programs. These are programs on adjoining days to other programs. <clears throat> if you see I'm delivering a program within a few hours of your department, and you think you might want to tag along as a companion, contact me. You can save as much as 20% off the program fee by being a companion program, and I do about 30 of those a year. No one ever complains about saving money. That's what I did for Hartford and Stoughton and Belmont this week. Okay, in today's feature segment, I interview members of the Lynchburg, Virginia Fire Department about a residential dwelling fire near-miss event. And when I'm done with the interview, stick around, and I'll tell you where you can attend an upcoming Situation Awareness Matters tour stop. Who knows, maybe there'll be one right in your state or right in your county. Hello, everyone. It's Rich Gasway from Situation Awareness Matters, and we are doing a video podcast today. And I have with me three guests from the Lynchburg, Virginia Fire Department, who recently I was in Lynchburg teaching a Situation Awareness class, and we got on the conversation about near-miss events, and they shared a near-miss event that was uh, a significant close call. So I asked them and they agreed to come on to the show to share their experience and their lessons learned with us. We have with us today uh, Captain Bob Mays, then from Engine 1. Bob, raise your hand just to let everybody know who you are. Thank you, Bob. And uh, John Ripley, Captain of Engine 6. John, all right, thank you. And Greg Wormser, Deputy Chief, but then Battalion Chief uh, on, the, on, the, on the day of the near-miss event. So let's start the show off with just a uh, a conversation about uh, the, the, the city of Lynchburg and the fire department and, and how, how you're structured and things like that. Well, the city of Lynchburg is uh, about 79,000 population uh, with a daytime population of about 120 to 130,000. Uh, we are the hub uh, of the four counties that surround us um, and we are in, an independent city. Uh, we have uh, significant challenges uh, related to topography and geography because uh, we're uh, right at the base of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, and we also have some significant challenges uh, with uh, our people uh, in the sense that we are a college town uh, with four uh, universities and colleges in the area. Uh, and so they have, uh, they bring a lot of business, they bring a lot of uh, infrastructure uh, changes to our community, uh, which uh, offers us uh, an opportunity to grow, uh, but also brings its challenges. Uh, we have eight stations in the city. Um, and the uh, fire department is divided into two uh, battalions. Uh, each uh, battalion has four stations. Uh, each battalion has a ladder truck, and each battalion has four engine companies. Additionally, we have uh, six uh, in-service medic units uh, that are all ALS, uh, 24 hours a day, um, and we work a 24 on, 48 off shift. So our daily complement uh, between the two battalions would be 53 personnel uh, assigned to the shift. Okay, thanks. And let's um, at, at the on the on the day of the fire, uh, Bob. How long had you been the captain on Engine One? Probably about 
seven years. Okay. And John, for you on engine six? Uh, only about six or seven months. I had just come out of from admin from being the health and safety officer at station six. Okay. And, and at that time, Greg, how long had you been a, a battalion chief? Uh, at that time, I'd been, uh, I was formerly the fire marshal, uh, which is a battalion chief's uh, rank. And I had been out of the office for about uh, a year and a half. Okay. Almost two years I've been out of the office when, when, on the day of the event. Okay. And uh, let's talk a little bit about what was happening just around, around the city and, and the fire department on the day of, uh, the, day of the fire. Well, it's a normal day. Uh, there was no uh, weather problems. Uh, there were no, uh, no graduations. Uh, there was no uh, extra activities going on. It was just sort of a regular one of the mill day, as most of those days typically are when something uh, like this occurs. It's when you least expect it, frankly. Uh, so the day was just the regular average day, and we got the call for the structure fire um, after a storm uh, had passed through. The storm had been gone for uh, a little bit of time. It wasn't wasn't a tremendous amount of time that it had been gone, but probably 30 minutes or so, the storm had already uh, passed through uh, the city. Um, and we got the call uh, for the house fire. Okay. And uh, what did the dispatch um, sound like? What what were they telling you on the, on the uh, initial dispatch? The initial dispatch was just as we normally uh, would uh, hear it and see it. Uh, we get all of our dispatch information on uh, mobile uh, data terminals and all of our apparatus. Um, the dispatch uh, <clears throat> looked just like a regular structure fire response and had the same uh, information. Uh, we sent three uh, engine companies, a ladder truck, a medic unit, our heavy rescue, and two supervisors, um, which is our normal structure fire response. Uh, and the, res- the call was for uh, smoke in a building or smoke in the structure. Um, they heard uh, the person who called had heard a loud pop or a loud bang Uh, And they had assumed that the house had been struck by lightning, although they couldn't find any fire. um, And all they could uh, see was smoke and all they could smell was smoke. Okay. And uh, who was, uh, who was first on scene? I was. I was, sir. And uh, what was was your size up on that? Um, Catching three views of three sides of the structure when we pulled up, we noticed that we had a fire, a working fire in the basement. Okay. Describe the structure for me. It was a, I'd say, two-story wood frame, old wood frame house, um, like in our historical area, rather on the large side, um, like a Victorian type con- construction. Okay. Was it uh, brick or or like wood sided or wood sided? Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, was everybody out? Or yes, did- sir. When I when I walked up to the house, I asked her, the occupant, if everybody was out, and she said yes. Everybody was out. They couldn't find where the fire was. Okay. We had seen it, a little bit of a glow toward the w- window in the basement when we were approaching the scene. So on we- on on which side? Uh, frame that up for me, Bob. That would be on the Delta side. Okay, thank you. And did you approach from the Delta side? When, yes, sir, we came up the street, we did approach from the Delta side. Okay. We had walked around the structure with our 360. Um, we had first found that it was best interest to um, get our hand lines in place while the second engines arrived. Okay. And uh, what the, what size line, line or lines did you guys pull? We had one inch and three quarter that we made entry to the basement. Okay. And, um, Due to the, it it's appeared to be some obstructions around the, the Charlie side of the um, residence. So we um, elected to go in on the first floor and it was a, you know, it wasn't a hard entry from the first floor to the, get to the basement. It was nice and well kept and we got down in the basement with no problem at all and um, appeared to have been making good headway on the fire. It was a real quick knockdown actually. All right. All right, hold on before we get get you inside yet. Uh, did you guys catch your own hydrant, or did somebody else catch a plug for you? Yeah, we'll call it the engine, uh, engine four, we call it engine. Yeah, the second end engine caught the. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, how many folks did you have on the entry with you? Two. 
Myself and another firefighter. You, yourself and another. And what, by the time you made entry, was any other company there yet, or was it just you guys at that point? Oh, it was other companies there. Okay, so um, what what other companies were on the scene prior to your making the entry? Engine, uh, the second end engine was there that took care of our water supply. Our battalion chief was there, and a medic unit was there. Okay, all right. <clears throat> okay, so as you as you made entry, um, okay, well, um, Bob, first arriving, I guess, makes you the the default incident command. Um, prior to entry, was the command then passed to Greg, or were you still in? Okay, so. <laughs> Yeah, let's not, let's not get inside the house yet. I want to want to frame up a few things here. So, Greg, you arrive. Then talk me through how command gets passed at this incident. So, uh, Bob and his crew did an excellent job um, on the 360, which is our normal uh, operating procedure. We do the 360 prior to entry uh, into any home uh, to, or any structure to make sure that. Uh, Fire, the fire doesn't need to be reset, make sure we know or are aware of any hazards that are there. So that he, his crew did an excellent job at 360, identified that the fire was in the basement um, and uh, said that they were going to make that initial attack and go in through the front door uh, and go right to the basement. Um, when I arrived on the scene, I was right behind him. So in all a matter of seconds, um, when he arrives on the scene, gives a size up, I just take command right then. I we actually didn't have a, a transfer of command because I was right behind him when he arrived on the scene. So I just assumed command at that point, um, repeated his size up so that everybody understood uh, the you know, what, what we thought at the time was going to be sort of a uh, standard house fire, if you will, or a house fire that we've been to on numerous occasions. Um, so gave that size up. And at that point, uh, we already had smoke coming out of the second floor eaves, um, which was a bit puzzling to us, although it sort of went along with, and then we started sort of putting some things together, went along with the circumstances surrounding with how the fire probably started. Uh, and we began to sort of realize at that point, when we start sort of putting the dispatch information together, with what uh, was reported to us by the occupants, that the house had been struck by lightning. Um, we, that, that became very clear. <clears throat> what we didn't know was how long uh, the fire had been going before it actually was noticed. Uh, and so as we begin to sort of evolve and sort of see that happen, we start to see the smoke coming out of the eaves. And that's when we sort of begin to realize that, you know, obviously the fire had grown, you know, much larger than we anticipated, although Bob's assessment of the situation was spot on. The seat of the fire was in the basement. Okay. And where did you position your command uh, at on the scene? Uh, uh, several houses uh, to the east of the incident uh, okay. or against the southeast of the incident. So we're on a, it was on a large uh, thoroughfare in the city called Rivermont Avenue. Um, and so I was well to the east uh, in line, you know, in line of sight of the building, uh, which is where I like to be but well out of the way because, frankly, I'm not the one doing all the work. And so I like to make sure the command post is um, in a place where it does not obstruct any real work that needs to be done. So it was down the street, but yet in line of sight uh, of the structure. So it was on the uh, Delta uh, Alpha side, which is on the uh, southeast corner. Okay. And as a matter of practice, do you command from inside a vehicle or outside of a vehicle? Uh, I command from outside a vehicle. So we have um, in all of our uh, command vehicles, command <clears throat> in the back. Uh, so we can do a lot of monitoring. We can draw stuff. We can write, take notes. We can use our passport tags interchangeably. So there's a variety of functions that we can do from the rear of our vehicle, and that's where that command function is, is taking place. And were you alone at command? Uh, initially, I was alone in, at command as the incident uh, grew, um, I ended up not being alone at command and had support staff from the office uh, helping me sort of monitor folks, uh, monitor the situation, keep keep the board active so that changes were made uh, accurately and in a timely fashion. Uh, but that sort of developed later on in the incident, you know, probably 45 minutes later or so. Okay. All right. Good. Thank, thanks for the, for the frame up there. Okay. Now, Bob, you can make your entry with your inch and three-quarter line, and we can talk about the fun stuff. <laughs> well, we made entry to the first floor. We had great visibility. It was um, um, no obstructions whatsoever getting to the basement door 
and getting down the steps to the basement. So no, no, no smoke on the first floor at all? No, sir. Okay. And um, after we made the basement, it was a sort of a winding, not a actual winding staircase, but it did change directions in three different ways. Um, old, you could tell it was an old type construction the way the basement was framed up. And then we, it was, went down there, we saw the glow and we put the fire out and we felt really confident about it. Um, we had, um, Captain Ripley was on the outside of the window and he reported back that he had good change in smoke color. And, um, you know, we were basically to the point of getting ready to start our overhaul in that, in the aspect of that. Um, basement fire. How, how good was your visibility in the basement, Bob? Um, after we had um, opened some door, a door, and it was one window, we opened that one window, it, 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 it really started clearing up really good. And as normal, you know, without setting up the fans yet, it was doing its job on its own. Okay. And, uh, all right, continue on. Um, Captain, we got a second. We we called command and told them that we had made an attack, and you know we felt real good about the interior conditions. And then we uh, started doing our overhaul in the basement. Um, somehow, in all that change, Captain Ripley's crew and my crew ended up on the second floor. And the best I can remember it is was because um, the battalion chief says, you know, hey, y'all need to go to the second floor and take a take a look and see what's going on up there. We were real confident about the basement in the first floor. And and we did, we went up to the second floor and we started doing some investigating. Did, did you take a line with you to the second floor? Yes, sir. Okay. Was it the line from the basement that went to the second floor? No, sir. There was another line. Yeah, we went out and picked, uh, Captain Ripley's crew bought in the second line from the first floor. Um, it was still really, really good visibility on the first floor. And, we bought another line in. We left the basement for uh, whoever was got sent to overhaul at that time. I don't, I'm not aware of who went to the basement to finish the overhaul. Mm -hmm. When we got to the second floor is when we really started, um, the puzzle started coming together, I guess you'd say, because um, we were getting reports from the outside and our reports were, to it was two totally different things. And from what we're seeing of what they're seeing, Okay, so what, what were the what was the reports that were that you were hearing that was different from what you were seeing? So outside at that point, when they said that they had uh, extinguished the fire and were beginning the overhaul in the basement, uh, there was already crews that were working upstairs, and that's about the time that we had to start switching bottles. And so that's where we were rotating people in and out and moving people around, and that's how uh, Captain Ripley and Captain Mays ended up together on the upstairs, is because. Uh, as folks were coming out and rotating bottles, I sent another crew down to the basement um, to work on that overhaul. And I sent Captain Ripley and Captain Mays upstairs with their crew to start working on um, the upstairs portion. Because what I was noticing on the outside was that the smoke on, coming from the eaves was still, you know, uh, fairly gray, uh, fairly thick. Um, but their conditions inside were, were not matching up. The conditions they were seeing uh, were fairly clear. And so we had to determine, you know, where that fire was. We obviously still had fire somewhere in the structure, um, in the walls, and it had crawled all the way up. And so, you know, I put them on a task because they knew where the fire had started. They knew how it maybe got up into the walls. I put them on a task of going and, and locating what was left of the fire or where that might be. Um, and so they had that line upstairs from the crew that had already been up there, and they started pulling uh, – pulling ceilings and walls, I guess, trying to find the location, you know, trying to find where the fire was, was still at inside the structure, inside those walls. John, on the, on the second floor, before you started opening walls and ceiling, describe the smoke condition prior to opening anything up. Prior to opening anything up, it was clear. I mean, it was maybe a light haze, but I mean, we were able to talk room to room and still visualize each other even from room to room. On the Charlie side is where we kind of noticed that it was more fire once we started opening up back there. But uh, once we really started opening up, everywhere we were opening, there was fire uh, in the walls and the ceiling. Uh, and, you know, we knew it was balloon framing to come up from the basement. Well, we thought as we were getting it, you know, we were putting it out as we were going. So we thought we were well ahead of it. We were just putting out hot spots. Uh, but 
basically was clear the entire time upstairs. I mean, it was never any points where we couldn't see each other uh, the, the entire time we were opening it up. But everywhere you opened, there was fire. Just about every, yeah. Every time we punched a hole, usually in a wall, there was, and it wasn't a ton, but it was enough that, you know, we knew it was in there and we knew we had, we opened it up. So we were like, all right, we start opening the walls, the ceiling and putting it out as we were going. And like I said, we thought we were well ahead of it. We were just, you know, catching up where it was gotten in the chases and stuff like that. Now, were, were these walls and ceilings, because of the age of the structure, were these walls and ceilings easier than average to open or harder than average to open? Harder. It was uh, tongue and groove, plaster, you know, so it, it took quite a bit, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's kind of where I was. <clears throat> this wasn't just uh, um, like a um, – uh, modern <laughs> uh, right. yeah, no. drywall, and, punch yeah. a hole in the drywall. And the conditions were so good, even I had a couple of younger guys with me that uh, this was one of the only couple of fires they've been to. We went into one room and it was totally clear. And, uh, you know, I told them, hey, we need to open the ceiling up. And they didn't even want to do that because they're like, hey, why are we messing this room up? And I told them, I said, you know, it, it's going to be in here. And as soon as they hit the ceiling, there was fire in the ceiling and the walls there too. So, in yeah. another room. Where, where, where was that room com in comparison to the first room that you had opened up in? Uh, right next door on the Bravo side, the Charlie or Bravo Charlie side. Okay. All right. So like an old library it had some books and stuff in it. Okay. And uh, is this information getting reported back to you, Chief, about what they're finding in the, with when they're opening the walls and the ceiling? Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they are in constant communication with us. We do, um, I think, as an organization, a great job at communicating effectively, uh, but not over communicating. So we communicate in the right manner and we communicate in a way that uh, our folks can get their job done without having to stay on the radio constantly. Because frankly, if I'm asking them a bunch of questions, uh, I'm not allowing them to do their work. And right. the rest of our battalion chiefs uh, also recognize the same thing. So we wait for those interior crews to want to communicate with us, to provide us the necessary information before we make that engagement because we know that they are actively working and working hard. Okay. Now how many, how many people are inside at this point? Um, I know we got, we got engine one and engine six crew, but I, how many people are we talking? Is there more than that? You've got, uh, so you've got six people upstairs, two engine companies, two total engine companies. Um, you have the rescue um, and uh, the ladder truck, two personnel off the ladder truck down the stairs. Uh, you have another engine that's outside for RIT, and then you have uh, the medic unit was split. We had one person on the RIT team, and then we had another person inside with the rescue and the ladder truck on the lower levels. So six, eight, 12 people inside. Six, six on the second floor, and then, and then or is there more than six on the second floor? Yeah, there, no, there's six on the second floor, two engine companies, and there's another six. Uh, so there's 12 people inside. Where's the other six? The other six are uh, – three are on the uh, main level on the first floor, and then three are on the in the basement division, uh, still yeah. working on the basement. Okay. All right, so pick, pick the story up and continue it on. So they're pulling ceiling. They're pulling and, – and reporting to me that, you know, conditions are fine, although they're continuing to find – uh, fire. They're continuing to extinguish fire when they find it, uh, and they're just going room to room. Uh, the first floor reports nothing. Um, they say they're just doing overhaul but have not seen any fire. They do have a little bit of smoke, but no, nothing else. And the basement said that they have a little bit of smoke, but essentially nothing else, and the fire had been extinguished completely there. So really, the only people encountering fire at this point are on the second floor. Um, that's Bob's crew and, and John's crew uh, working together uh, up on that second floor. The uh, Interested, interesting thing is, is that from my standpoint at this point, conditions are continuing to get worse. Uh, so at a time when, when I believed, based on my experience, that conditions should be improving, uh, and they're not, you know, they're on the radio communicating, they're not excited, they're not over, overdone about it, they're just, hey, we're just moving along, and conditions just aren't improving at all. Uh, the, the, at this point, the smoke isn't getting worse on the outside, um, but it's not getting any better like it should be. Um, you know, when they report that they're extinguishing fire, you should see a change in the smoke and you just, we're just not seeing it at this point. Um, are you, are you, are you telling them, Greg, that things aren't looking better from the outside? Yeah, or you yeah. just... 
Yeah, he, I'm constantly yeah. telling him that, hey, things aren't looking better from the outside. They're really not looking worse at this point, but we just haven't had any significant change. And that's when we, um, the health and safety officer at the time happened to be um, one of our uh, aerial operator experts, frankly. Um, and so when he arrives on the scene, I actually task him with setting the ladder because that crew is inside, um, setting the ladder so that we can get an aerial view of what might be going on or maybe use the aerial to our advantage uh, because we just don't seem to be making any headway. And I'm worried at this point that the fire is so far above them or, or so extensive above them that we're just not going to catch it. And so uh, that operator sets the aerial ladder. Um, and it's about that point that things just continue to get, at that point, really start to get worse. Okay, because this interview went almost an hour, and because it's really starting to get to the good point, I'm going to pause here and continue the rest of the interview in the next episode. So this will be a two-part show, and we'll pick it up, and they'll tell you what happened and how things turned worse. And uh, that'll be the second part of the interview. It'll be about uh, about the same same length, almost uh, 30 minutes in the interview. Thank you, Deputy Chief Greg Wormser, Captain Bob Mays, and Captain John Ripley for sharing that amazing near-miss story. If you've experienced or witnessed a near-miss and would like to have a platform to share your lessons learned with others, contact me by visiting the essaymatters.com website and clicking on the Contact Us link on the top of the homepage. Think about it for a moment. The lessons learned from your near-miss event could save the life of another first responder. If you want to share your experience, contact me. You might have heard at the front of that interview where I said this was a video podcast. I'll be uploading those videos on my YouTube channel for people that might want to watch the interviews. <clears throat> okay, as I always do, I want to take a moment to thank the departments and organizations that have hosted some great training for their members on situational awareness. I do this to show my appreciation to the organizations who put forth the effort to organize, advertise, and fund great training experiences for their members and others in their region. Recent tour stops included the New York City Fire Department FDNY Incident Management Team, the Ontario Fire Chiefs Association Conference, the Ontario Fire Training Officers Association Conference, the Hartford, Connecticut Fire Department, and where I am now in the middle of nine days of consulting and training for the United States Navy at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in Kittery, Maine. And while I'm here, I also do programs for Stoughton, Fire Department and Belmont Fire Department. Then May 31, I'll be at the Colorado Springs Fire Department. June 10th, Beaver Lake, Arkansas. June 12th to 16th, the Woodlands Fire Department of Texas doing the company week-long Company Officer Development Institute. And then I'm going to take a little time off to spend with my family. If you want to see the locations of all the upcoming Situational Awareness Matters tour stops, head over to the SA Matters website, click on the blue box on the right side of the homepage labeled Upcoming Events Schedule. The uh, schedule is always changing, so check back often. While I was delivering programs in southwest Minnesota, I had an opportunity to stop by and visit my amazing sponsor for this podcast, Midwest Fire. Midwest Fire makes all poly-bodied fire apparatus, and it's changing the industry. You seriously need to check them out at MidwestFire.com. While I was there, I got a chance to sit down and talk to a few of their employees about what separates Midwest Fire from their competitors. Here I got to talk to account executive Dalton Lingbeck about the all-poly design of the Midwest Fire Trucks. Let's listen in. Okay, Dalton, I see in the advertisements that one of the things that differentiates Midwest Fire from their competitors is this all-poly Design. So, wh- what does that mean? All, all poly. Yeah, describe that for me. Yeah. Well, poly is actually pretty common in the industry. Uh, poly tanks are seen inside bodies all over. Uh, manufacturers do them all the time. They've started around the '80s, I believe. But all poly means that our tank and body is all poly integrated. It's one big uh, superstructure. Um, you're not you're not sliding a tank inside of a body. You're not sliding a tank anywhere. It's actually one big built body um, that we do, and it's it's made of three quarter inch copolymer. Uh, it's extremely durable, and it is uh, it's industrial grade, and it's the kind of poly you can beat the crap out of. Okay, well, I I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit of a skeptic there because you say that that poly is durable, and I own a lot of things that are plastic. In fact, I was just at home last week and we had this appliance that had plastic parts on it and I accidentally dropped it on the floor and it just 
it didn't shatter, but it just cracked, cracked so easy, and it just, it, you know, and I only dropped it, you know, a, a couple of feet. So, I'm a skeptic. When you say poly is durable, I think, I think of poly or plastic as something that isn't durable. That's that's gonna crack easy or dent easy. So you got to convince me on this one. Yeah. Well, yeah, trust issues definitely come up with poly. Um, but let me grab down here something really quick. As you can probably see on the screen right now, this is a piece of poly that we use. It is the same type of material, the same thickness, it's three quarter inch. And what you might notice on here is it has bullet holes. So basically, if you trust a bulletproof vest to take bullet holes, I mean, when they first tested it, they wanted to shoot holes through it and see if it worked. And you can shoot holes through it. So what do we do? We did the same exact thing. We wanted to shoot holes in the theory that poly wasn't durable and poly wasn't reliable. And we tried to shoot holes through it, but as you can see right here, the bullets actually could not go through. And there's actually a bullet stuck in the bottom of this one because it won't get all the way through. Now, truth be told, there was one weapon that did go through this piece of poly, and it was a 30 6 high caliber rifle. It did go through, but uh, that's a 30 6 high caliber rifle. So what, the, what, it was a 45 caliber on the other side? Yes. And so what I'm looking at is, is essentially... Um, there's marks on the poly <clears throat> where the bullets hit, but as I look, as you show me the backside, it, it didn't go all the way through. No, yeah, and the backside you, doesn't even have any dents in the backside. Huh. Um, actually, when we were doing this test video, one of the bullets, I think it was on the 380, actually bounced off and back towards the person that shot the um, the piece of poly. So no, the the bullets did not go through. They actually either stuck in there or they bounced off. Okay. That's how strong this stuff actually is. All right, so there you have it, right from the horse's mouth, shooting holes, <laughs> literally, <laughs> in the concept that poly is not a durable product on which to build a fire truck. So if you're interested in learning more, check them out at MidwestFire.com. Thank you, Midwest Fire President Sarah Atchison and all your wonderful staff for the awesome commitment you make to improving first responder safety. I sincerely appreciate your support of my mission. If you're not a member of the SA Matters community of learners yet, consider joining. There are over 5,000 members connected here on SA Matters, sharing ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to train members to be critical thinkers and resilient problem solvers. Membership is free. 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 And when you sign up, you get a special report I've created for new members called 25 Best Practices for Improving First Responder Safety. It's free, too. Joining also gets you my monthly email newsletter. That's free, too. And it contains featured con content from the blog and from this podcast. It's really the best way for us to stay in touch with each other. If you're not a member yet, head over to the SA Matters website. Click on the red box on the right side of the homepage. It says free membership. If you want to get connected with me on Twitter, you can follow at Rich Gasway on Twitter. On LinkedIn, you can search for Rich Gasway on LinkedIn. On YouTube, you can watch my video channels on SA Matters TV channel on YouTube. And on Facebook, you can like the SA Matters page on Facebook. Well, that's it. Episode 162 is complete. Thank you again to our guests from Lynchburg, Virginia Fire Department, Captain Bob Mays, Captain John Ripley, and Deputy Chief Greg Wormser. Thank you to our awesome podcast sponsor, Midwest Fire. Thank you to all of our live event hosts. Thank you to our more than 700 online academy students. And thank you, our listeners, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gasway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgasway.com.